Hi, this is Ryan Gordon again. Um, thanks for watching the first piece, if you're still here, I appreciate it. Um, since we're all stuck in our homes for however long, I figured we'd try and build Tetris in Dragon Ruby so you can get a feel for what some basic game development looks like and you know what Ruby looks like if you're new to that. Um, if, you watch the if you're here new, then you should probably go back and watch the first uh, video. Uh, otherwise, we're going to just jump in where we left off. Um, we um, don't need you to understand C or game develop. Or, I'm sorry. <laughs> Try that again. Don't need you to understand Ruby or game development as long as you understand a little programming. All this is going to look kind of familiar, and I'll try to smooth over over the parts that look a little different. Um, mostly, I write in C and C plus uh, plus, depending on what I'm doing. But you know, we're braving our way through Ruby here. Okay, so if you're watching last time, I was trying to figure out. Let me run this thing again. Why these blocks were going only. They weren't stacking right, they are kind of overlapping a little. And I sat here and stared at this for a while after doing the uh, recording yesterday. And uh, first off, you can see this more clearly if we make these run at the normal speed we intended them to. So this is going to drop. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. It's pretty slow, but we're going to just watch this thing go. And I'll stop there because it hits the end of that grid, which is this thing right here. And then the next piece is going to come down, and it's going to overlap this by one instead of landing on top of it. Boop, there you go. And that's wrong. So um, so I stared at this for a while last night, and there's where we check if it hits the bottom of the grid. That's correct. And then I check this thing here where it's supposed to see if there's it's touching any piece. But the bug here is that this is looking to see, you know, if the current piece of the grid, uh, where our one square of our current piece is touching anything that already exists in the grid, but we shouldn't be looking for if it's touching it right now, we should be looking for if the next time this slides down, it would touch the thing. So that's to say we should be looking one right here, one uh, level lower than the piece is currently sitting at to see if it will collide with it. So I'm going to hit save on that, and we're going to watch dramatically to see if this works. Dun, dun, dun. Will it make it? I don't know. Let's find out. And there's hitting the grid at the bottom. That was this test right here. And here we go. Will it make it? Let's find out. And yes. There we go. So we were just checking this wrong because this code down here, it says, is it time to drop the piece? Is it colliding? But we're looking at, at the wrong level. We need to see if the thing below it would be a collision, not the piece it's currently on. So that solves that. Now these things are stacking up nicely. We'll make this move faster just so you can see. There you go. Bump, bump, bump. Okay, so the next thing we need to add, now that we have solved this mystery from last night, is some way for these blocks to move around, because it's really boring just to watch them build a tower and then give up. So we're going to need to add some input to this now, uh, so that the user can interact with the game and the game will respond. Now, um, let's see, I guess this, like everything else, what we'll do, like any game would, is we'll check this every time through this iterate function. So 60 times a second, we're going to wait, we're going to look to see if there's keyboard input, and just for extra credit, we'll also act, add uh, con game controller support too, because it's actually not hard at all. So what we need to do now is come in here and figure out what's going on. Uh, so before we do anything, we're, this is iterate, we're going to do uh, all our stuff right before we calculate all the magic here so that there's they don't have to wait till the next time through the function if they move something that 16 milliseconds isn't lost before the game responds to their movement so we do that before we process the game state before we decide if things have moved we always check input first so you don't get a 16 millisecond lag because you're running 60 times a second that's 16.6 repeating uh, milliseconds that you'd be losing so we always check this first now, this is a mouthful. I'm going to type this out for you so you can see it. Uh, Dragon Ruby supplies this on the arg structure like they do everything else. Instead of, now when we draw things, we're doing ah, args, output, whatever. But naturally, if you're looking for input, we have it on a thing called inputs. Now, we're just going to look at keyboard stuff right now. Now, down here, we have a field called key down and then you take the name of the thing that you're looking at, left, 
or right or up or down or the letter A for the A key and stuff like that. Um, that's a giant mouthful, so we're going to trim that down just a little bit. Let's get a little local variable here called K, which will hold the keyboard so we don't have to type this over and over again through this function. So, K. Okay. So, now all you do is when you get down to, you know, key down left, where that's, a, that's a Boolean, true or false. If they have just pressed on this time through your tick function, through iterate, if they have just this time pressed the left arrow key on their keyboard, then key down left will be true. Uh, and next frame it will be false again. This is good if you want to know if someone has just started to hit a key. Um, it will not tell you well, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so let's start with that. So we can say if key down left, uh, let's see here. Now let's just keep this really simple for now. If key down left, we already know that we have a variable we keep, current piece x and current piece y to tell us where the thing that is dropping through space on the Tetris grid, where that thing starts. So we, we already know where that is. All we gotta do is change that variable. When you're going to the left, it'll be minus one. And if you're going to the right, it'll be plus one. Right? Maybe something like that. Good. So let's go ahead and save that and see if it works. I'm going to make this fall slower again like it's supposed to. Um, now you'll note that I didn't do if left, else right. We check them both, and the theory is that if they mash both of those keys at the same time, it'll just cancel each other out, and you end up not moving the piece at all, because it subtracts one, then adds one right away. Um, there's different philosophies on this, but that seems like the most reasonable thing. All right, I'm going to hit save and see if it runs. Here we go. All right, I'm going to hit left. Oh, I'm on the wrong window. Hang on. Hit left. There it goes. I'm going to hit right. There it goes. Now you can see the obvious, and, and we land on the grid. Good. Now you can see the obvious problem is about to happen here. I'm going to hit left a whole lot. Okay, that's definitely not what we want. I'm going to hit right a lot. That's definitely... Oh, and then we crash because we we're outside the grid array. So I'm going to hit save on that again. Oops. On this window, and that'll pop that back up. There you go. So, yeah. But let's see, just since we're moving these around, just for testing purposes, let's make sure these actually stack correctly. I'll just put one right next to it so it's kind of overlapping it a little bit. All right, so that seems to be working pretty well. That's good. Let's see if we can hit it from the side here. Well, that's an obvious bug. We'll have to work on that. Okay, cool. Just let those stack up for now. Um, okay, so obviously in, in here when we're... Uh, check input. Let's see. While we're in here, we obviously you just want to make sure that you don't go past the beginning. So... Uh, Current piece x, the x there is the top left corner of the array, so if that's at zero, you don't want to go any further to the left, because that means you're at the edge of the grid. Current piece x is greater than zero. You don't have to put parentheses around your if condition, uh, your if uh, expressions like you do in C. It's just muscle memory. I keep doing that. You can see I did a couple of places up above here. All right, so let's do that real quick. Now, theoretically, when I save this, there, I can go right, but can't go left past the end of that. So, okay, that's progress. Let's do the same thing on the other side. All right, let's see here. Um, if current piece x, let's be plus, not a minus, okay. Current piece x is less than or equal to grid width, which is Maybe grid width minus one. Let's try minus one to see. I think you're going to find in game development that an enormous amount of things or an enormous amount of your problems are just trying to decide things should be plus one or minus one uh, from where you think they should be. And you know, don't think about it too hard. Usually, just wiggle it a little bit till it works. Sad but true. Okay, so we're going left. We're going right. Nope. Clearly, that was that was wrong. Uh, current piece x. Oh, I bet I know. Let me try that one more time. So I bet this was okay until. We went two pieces past the edge of the grid, because there's... No, it's only at one. Okay. Oh, because that's still going to look past it. Okay, but... So, as I was saying before, current piece X, that is the top left piece of the block, but 
the block may be several, uh, the top left piece of the Tetris piece, but it might be several squares large. So, so what we actually want to be is current piece X plus, uh, I guess, current piece length, because you have an array, and that will always be the the width will be the first one because that's the x coordinate. Okay, so as we said before, length is the the size of your array. That's just built into all arrays in Ruby. So if we say the from where the piece is, the top left piece is in space plus the length of it. So if you have the square piece here and it's you know these x's are each squares in it, and then y over here is the grid, the the edge of the grid then you want to be able to say, okay, if our position is at zero, one, two, if your position is at zero and the length of this is two, so be zero plus two is two, obviously, would be the edge of the grid. You need to be less than the grid size. Okay, I have less than equal here, is that? So let's get rid of that minus one, just say less than. And I think that should work. Let's see if I'm right about that. Here we go into the right. There, it's stopping me. I can go left, but I can't go further right. And I can still go to the left. Okay, good. Making progress here. This is nice. Okay. Now let's make it go faster. All right, so the same as you have left and right, you also have down. So if the down arrow is pressed, then let's just do something very simple here. Some versions of Tetris just immediately drop the brick when you press the down key. I don't really care for that. I always like the Game Boy version where it kind of just made it speed up so you had time to think and correct if you had a problem. So let's say while the key is down, let's make the next move go 10 instead of 1, which is say since it's 30 overall, that means it takes, uh, you know, it goes 3... It, it goes three times as fast. No, it goes ten times as fast while that key is down. All right, let's see how it worked. So if I'm smashing the key, it's going a little faster, you can see. But what I really wanted to do here is say instead of key down, you want to say key held. Actually, let's even do this. So key held or key down. We'll check both. Why not? So in the inputs array the Dragon Ruby gives you, key down means this key was just pressed this frame, in this tick, uh, in this iteration, they've just pressed the key down. Next frame, if they're still holding down that key, and they probably are because most people can't pick up the key again in less than 16 milliseconds, um, that key down will be false because it's not a new key press anymore. But key held, key held will be true. So you, you can decide if they're you want to do something different if they've just hit a key for the first time or if they're holding a key down over time. Um, or in this case, we're going to check both because we would like it, the, the brick to go faster as long as we think that key is being pressed in any for any reason. So let me try it here. Okay. Left, right, here comes down. Definitely faster until I let go. Yep, that's nice. Okay. And then when you let go, it goes back to the normal ticking speed. Okay, that's good. That's what we're looking for there. Okay, and as you can see, now we're starting to stack up bricks in there, kind of doing kind of doing Tetrisy things. This is kind of nice. Okay, good. I like this. This is going very nicely here. All right. So the next thing we're going to need is other brick types, unless we want to just do obscure block art like this. This is kind of. I think I made a house. This is fun. Let me see. Oh yeah, that's good. I like it. Let me get a skyscraper. Okay, or a middle finger. I don't know what I just did there. Okay, cool. Good. Um, before we get any fancier here, let's add one other feature to this that I think is important. Input. So we have K, that was just our easier, shorter way to say args input keyboard. We can also do this with game controllers, two of them in this case, but we're going to just do it with one. Just the, the thing we identify as player one, whatever that might be. And we go through a lot of different steps on different platforms to figure out what that might be. But, um, but these are meant to be game controllers, and we're not going to get into the whole science and theory of this. We're just going to do something very quickly here and say, um, um, let's make that C instead of K. Okay, so right here we're just checking if the left key is down, but let's also check, wait, all right, yeah. Instead of just checking that, we're going to do if left key down or the left key on the controller is down. And when we say 
left key in this case, we mean like the left directional pad. I'm going to hit save, lose my beautiful middle finger art. And let's see, here's the left key. Yep, there it goes. I'm, I'm holding a PlayStation 4 controller that's plugged in through USB. I can't move it right because we only changed the one thing. All right, let me bring this back up real quick here. I'll just do this for the other things too. So if we hit key left down or on the controller or the keyboard, and let's do this for this too. C or C. Okay, so basically just the exact same code, but with the controller, the first controller we see instead of the keyboard. So either one of these will not work. I'm holding the PlayStation 4 controller and going with the thing, going go left and right, and left and down goes faster. There we go. Cool, progress. I mean, obviously we have a ways to go on Tetris itself still, but you can see a very big difference. Like this, this is, I mean, you're drawing something to the screen that's responding to a game controller's input, but this is as close to a video game as you can get without actually writing a video game at this point. So um, obviously we're gonna continue to make this more tetris -y as we go, but I mean, uh, already this is, uh, you're nine tenths of the way there now. Before I said you're like halfway, but you're really, we're getting very close now to this. Okay, so we have some input. The next thing we're gonna need though is probably some pieces. Uh, other than just squares, because it's not Tetris if you just have the little two by two blocks. So, um, so I guess we're going to need to figure that out real quick. Okay, let's go find our initialize function. So, rather than figure these out every time, let's go and build up a little list of uh, things we can do here. Let's see, what would we call this? Uh, okay. Well, actually, hang on, let's do it this way for now. I got a better idea. So down here, we have the plant current piece. We're going to make it when we plant one that we pick a new one. But let's do this in a separate function, because I can think of another time we're going to need this in a moment. Select next piece. All right. so. This is pretty simple here. So as the, as this looks right now in our init function, let me go find that. Let's go find this, select next piece. Okay, boop. So this is what the next piece, this is how we picked our first piece, is just a, a two by two block. And the, we mush this down into one line just for simplicity, but this is basically a two dimensional array with everything set to one, uh, just so it's non-zero, right? Um, cool. Um, and we'll set to zero if it's in a regular piece, but since it's uh, this guy right here, it's always all four pieces of it are filled in. But over here, some of these pieces, like on this zigzag shape, those are going to be this part here and this part here, they would be zeros. Um, so let's get this right here. Okay. Um, so what we want to do is instead of always hard coding it to this, we want to have a couple of different things it can be. So let's try and do... Um, Okay, I'll show you what a case statement looks like in uh, Ruby. Because if you're coming from C or a C-like language like JavaScript or PHP or anything like that, it looks a little bit different. It's enough to be familiar but also weird. There's no switch word. It's just called case. And you would say, um, you know, um, rand is the, ra is the random function. You say rand. How many pieces are there? Let me see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven... Okay, so come back. Where'd you go? Okay, so if you do rand seven, that'll give you a number between zero and six because we gave you an integer. That's just a nice little feature of the rand function in in um, in Ruby because that's just you know that's what you end up needing more than often in the not is I need an integer between these two ranges. So okay, so we're gonna say give me a random number between zero and six. And then we're just going to do a switch statement and do something different depending on which one we get. They don't use case uh, like C and Java and stuff do because they use that up here. The word, the magic word in Ruby is when. I'm going to say, so when it's zero, then uh, give me whatever. Now, normally you would have to have some sort of uh, declarative statement here in C. But here in, in Ruby, you can do this nice thing. You can say when the random number is zero, then some value, and that will be returned to this 
thing here, current piece, will get assigned whatever we give it in this then section. So you can just give it a simple expression, which is super nice uh, for our purposes right here. So let's see here. Um, okay, so if we wanted to do like an L shape, where'd you go? Let me do like this booger right here. We're gonna do, okay, so that would look like one, zero, zero. If you had the two dimensional array, you'd have one, zero, zero, one, one, one. So the first line would be, one would be, would be set, that would be this little uh, thing sticking up here. And then the bottom row would all be set, which would be of course these three down here. And then the other two parts are zero because that those parts are blank on this piece. Okay, easy peasy. So we just need to then package that thing up correctly, which is always, I always get this wrong the first time, so. Um, let's drop them in vertically, though. I don't know if that's better or worse. We might change this later. I don't know. We'll see. But that would be 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, like that. Yeah, there's your L. Okay, and then, of course, Tetris has two different L's facing opposite directions. We'll do that in a second, too. But Okay, so your X and your Y's. Then, okay, so we're just going to literally give an expression, in this case, a two-dimensional array. So it would be, let me make sure I get this right. I think this is right, we'll see how it goes. Okay, zero, comma, one, zero, comma, one, and then the last line is one, one. All right, so that should do it. Let's just test that real quick and just say, let's pop this right, comment this stuff out and just say, right now it's always that. So at this moment in time, we have the original square is set when we do the initializer right now, just for, because we haven't changed that yet. So then when we select, we call select next piece, it'll give us an L shape if I did this right. Let's find out. So we have a function called plant current piece, and that's when we say we're definitely done with this piece, we're making part of the grid, and we're gonna start a new one. As you can see, we already have it at that point setting the uh, current location of the piece back to the top. Let's make that x back to the center too, I guess. So current piece y, current piece x, and of course we'll set select next piece at that point, which will set up a new piece for us that looks different than the last one. Let's see what it looks like. All right, here comes our box. I'm gonna drop it to the bottom and we should get an L. We did, hooray, okay. And can we, uh, and there'll all be L's after that because select next piece always gives us just that one thing. Okay, good, progress. Let's get some more pieces in here. Uh, let's get our random thing back in here. So there's our 1L. 0 will give you that. That's 1. And we're just going to go through all of these really quickly here. So let's see. I guess the other direction one. Let me see that piece again real quick. So it's that. I shouldn't have rotated this. I'm having regrets. 0, 0, once we did. Okay, so we did that guy, right? Let me see what he looks like. Yeah, okay, we did that guy. Well, that's a fun little picture. I like that. Okay, so we need it just to be the two slide over there. So this should be one, one, and that'll be zero, and that'll be one. And that should just flip the two. And let's just try that real quick, just in case one, so it always gives us that. Oh, that's something crashed there. Oh, uh, case statements like all other multi line statements in Ruby have to have an end on them. There you go. Okay, there we go. So there's our block dropping, and then there's our other L. That's nice. Okay, good. Good. Okay, so let's just test all of these real quick then. Two. Okay, what do we got left? Let's do this long one here. That one's easy. Uh, one, 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 one. Now note that this is still a two-dimensional array, but there's only one line to it because it's a straight line, right? We don't you don't have to split into multiple things because there's only one, lo one, one line. Is that right? Did I do that backwards? I did that backwards, didn't I? Well, I, don't know, I guess I'll drop vertically. Let's find out. Let's see if I got that wrong. Wait, I did this wrong too. Case two. There we go. Give me this back. Yeah, it drops vertically. Okay. Love it. We'll keep it. Uh, okay, so what other lines do we have here? We got this bricky thing here. Let's do that real quick. When three, update this real quick. So it would be uh, OK, 
Okay, so that would be one, zero. If I get this right, I might be getting this wrong. One, zero, then one, one, and then zero, one. Okay, let's see if I got it right. Oh, that looks good. Right? I guess. Sure. Okay, I'll take it. Are there two of those? Let me see. Oh, there are two of those. Okay. Come back. So it's that, and then one that faces the other way. Y'all having a good time watching me enter, uh, do data entry over here? Okay, so zero. that right yes okay good and then which one am I missing oh of course the original block need that guy too one five then that so it should just stay blocks they do okay and I guess what I missed the T is that what I missed got that guy got that guy that guy, that, 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 just the T, that's it, so. So, let's see, number six will be. Zero, one, done, done, and then zero, one. Let's see if I got that right. I did, okay, good. Lots of T's. Like a football or something. Okay, cool. Alright, so that should be all of them. Current piece equals that. And then we can, we're going to change this. Instead of hard coding it, we're going to actually do a random number each time. And we should, theoretically, get different pieces now. There you go. Oh yeah, looking nice. I love it. Okay, so one thing I'm noticing right now before we do anything else is that as soon as these different colored shape, these different shapes land, they're all the same color and it's hard to tell which piece was which. Although I'm really digging the ASCII art we're doing with this. It's pretty cool. Okay. Um, it's like a robot or something. I love it. Robot Samurai. Okay, so we need color for these things too. So let's do this. Let's save this thing as a random thing like this. And let's make it... Okay. So let's make it 6 plus 1. So instead of getting a, a random number from 0 to 6, you'll get a random number from 1 to 7. And I say that because instead of filling these in as 1s or zeros, we're going to fill them in You know, having just done that, I don't really like the R. Let's make that a big X so this seems, you know, nitpicky in this regard. I'll switch uh, make that capital X. Looks more serious, I don't know. So basically, each what this is going to do is going to go through this case statement, and it's going to fill in either zero for a blank spot or the number of the piece we just took will be filled in there. So if the if this piece is supposed to have a, a square filled in, it will be a non-zero number. And if it's not supposed to be filled in, it'll be a zero. But that number that is filled in will be unique to that type of piece so that you can see, so we can separate these by color when we draw them. So good, this is super easy now that we have that in place. This won't do anything now except give you the same pieces right here. Boop, yeah, okay, they're still red because we have not changed the drawing routines for this, but um, okay, so let's fill those in real quick just so we can tell these apart. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, so, oh, one other thing before I forget. This current piece, let's get rid of this at the beginning. And we'll just make this actually, what I call that function? Select next piece. Call select next piece. And we can get rid of these two because we're going to set those up down there. All right. So now, at initialization, initialization time, we'll have selected the next piece, so it'll be set to go. There you go. You can see it's already nice here. Okay, good. We're making progress here. We're getting rid of stuff we hard coded earlier. Okay, so let's. Speaking of stuff we hard coded earlier, render grid. Here we go. 
So right now, the way we render this grid is we call render cube, and we have red, green, blue, full intensity red, blue and green zero. So obviously, as you can see, they're all totally red over here. Um, that's just hard coded in here. So we're going to change that, but we're going to need some actual colors. All right, so let's do that real quick. Uh, okay, yeah, let's just do that up here. Call that color index. And we're just going to do a big old array because we just love hard coding numbers here. So we'll just call it, if you look for index zero, this is going to be just an array of arrays as things are. And these are each going to be a red, green, blue value. All right, so we'll just, we'll make one red make the next one. I don't know. We, we can look up real colors for this later. Get a little web tool or something like that for that. But for now, we'll just make them all intensity of something unique. So, 255, and that's fill. Let's do this one. 255, and then down here we can do this. I don't know which of these are going to be which right now. But, and you know what? Let's do, uh, let's do one for the, the border, too, so we can just not worry about if we want to change this, this background color from white, we can just have something here. I'm going to make it a nice gray. All three numbers the same, make it a shade of gray. 127 is half intensity, so that'll be a grayish color. We'll do that. We can use that later on, so that's good. Okay, and if something happens to try and draw with color zero, it'll be black. But we're not going to do that because all our grid pieces are um, zero means don't draw it. So, But it's there in case we do. All right, so let's come down here, find where we're drawing that thing. All right, da -da done. Okay. Oh, here you go. Okay, so render background. Where'd you go? Render grid border, I mean. All right, so let's uh, change this color here. Just color index. What did I call that thing? It was six, I think. No, it was a seven. It was seven. Yep, okay, so those turn, that turned a little grayer, that's good. And we're a little less hard-coded here, so that's cool. Now let's go down here and find our cube. Where'd you go, where'd you go? Render current piece, and that just goes through render cube. Okay, and this needs... Okay, so this needs... Dun, dun, dun. Here we had a hard-coded red, we're gonna change that to current piece. X, Y, although to be fair, all the pieces are a single color. It's, you know, so that's just going to end up with the same number again. But in case we get fancy and have multicolored pieces later, we might as well do it. It's no big deal. And we're going to put a star in front of that, because that... Well, actually, here, we could just do this. This will... Eh, yeah, let's put a star in front. We'll keep it simple for now. Um, no, I changed my mind. Okay, we'll change render cube to actually just do the color index lookup. Where'd you go? Render cube. In fact, let's just look for everywhere we called render cube because we're going to change this anyway. Okay, so RGBA, that's going away. We're just going to say color. And da -da done. Where did our thing go here? RGBA will make that put a star there so it splats this out. Color index, color. There you go. So that should still do the same thing, but now we got to change everywhere we said render cube. So this is a hard-coded red before, but now we want the grid, X and Y. So whatever color is on the grid, we'll now render that instead of just hard-coded to red. And that was already changed to be color. We'll make that 7. There you go, because it's going to do the color index. These don't need to be stars anymore, because we're just passing in an integer instead of an array. And this one we... Pretty fixed up for rendering the current piece, and that's it. Okay, I'm gonna hit save. Let's see if we have a very much more colorful Tetris board now. Yes, we do. We have green. Let's see. And yes, turquoise or whatever that is. Cyan, I mean, yeah. There we go, and then that's yellow. Very nice. Here we go, red. Oh yeah, I love this. And a lot of those pieces. Oh yeah, it's looking good, looking good. Piece having a gun. There's a purple one. I like that. Good. Is there another L we didn't get yet? Yeah, better written in a number generator here. I don't know. Oh, there's only one of those. Oh, no, I thought I had two of those. I don't know. Maybe I got it wrong. I don't know. Oh, there's one. I just saw one. Okay, good. 
Hmm. This also shows you a bug that everything now sitting at the top here is just keeps popping in a new piece, so we're going to have to deal with that too. But this is progress, this is progress, it's looking good. Okay. Um, okay, now that we can tell these apart, we can... Well, let's go one step further here, since we're here already. Where's render cube at? All right, so right now our cube is just this giant gobbledygook to draw a single box for each piece of this, right? So let's add a little definition to that and say outputs order, which is just a one pixel rectangle uh, instead of doing a, a filled in rectangle like solids is. Border is just uh, lines that make that rectangle the edge of it. So let's do the exact same x, y, width and height. And let's make the color index always bright white at the exact same position as that each individual square of these pieces are done. So let me do that and see what happens here. Oh, nope, I broke something. Hang on. Outputs border. What did I do wrong? Uh, where'd you go? Oh, borders. I spelled it wrong. Border is plural. There you go, straight lines across everything. Now it looks very Tetrisy, right? You can see where each individual piece begins and ends. A little less so in the yellow, but oh yeah, it's looking good. I like that. Okay, good. Wow, it's really starting to look like Tetris now. I can't believe it. Cool. Okay, now the problem this doesn't look like Tetris is because I cannot rotate these pieces, which is driving me nuts. And I'm sure the more obsessive amongst you are looking at this going, look at all the gaps he's leaving in there. I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's fix that. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so let's go back to our input because we haven't told how to render pieces, uh, how to rotate pieces. So let's do that real quick here. All right, so we have, uh, here's our input stuff. We can move move it faster. Let's just put another thing here. If you hit K, key, key down. I'm just going to do the letter A. A and S right next to each other so you can put your hands right on it. I don't know what the appropriate keyboard binding is for, um, for Tetris, but that will do for now. Let's do that. A and... Okay, just that. We'll say end. Oops, now we need to rotate current piece left, and we'll do it the same over here. Oops, well, that'll crash as I hit the A button because that function doesn't exist, so boom. Okay, we'll fix that. Current piece right. Let's get that implemented real quick here. Now, I gotta tell you, as a confessional piece here, I looked this part up on Stack Overflow, and I wrote it down so that I wouldn't have to try and puzzle through this while you all stared at me and laughed. Um, let me find my note on this really quickly here. Okay. Sure. Okay. Here we go. Take the current piece. The current piece is a two-dimensional array. All we want to do is something called transpose, which is to say we're going to take that array and we're going to flip it a little bit. We're going to literally rotate the contents of it, um, which might change the dimensions of the array, I might add, because if it, uh, for example, this red piece falling right here, that's a two by, that's a three by two array, but if you rotate it, it's suddenly a two by three array, so those things can change here. But um, for arrays, Ruby has a function called transpose, and then some other stuff I'm not going to explain to you because I don't fully understand it myself. Someone can laugh at me about that later. I don't care. But basically, you're going to take, you're going to map the array backwards and then transpose it, and that'll basically end up rotating it the way we would like it to be. I hope. Let's find out. Oh, that will not because that doesn't do it in place. You have to actually assign it to. It makes a copy of it. So current piece equals that. That'll do it. So here we go. Let's get over here and let's hit the A button to rotate. Boop. There you go. We got rotation, baby. And do 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 love it. Okay, cool. Still gotta fix that. Okay. Neat. Um okay, so you may be thinking that rotating it right would be the same way, and you might be, but I couldn't get it to work, so 
I went for the cheap way and just said, why don't we just rotate it left three times, which is stupid, but it got the job done. So here's left, here's right, which doesn't look very different there. Left, right, left and right, left and right. Okay, cool. Um, now I'm gonna show you the obvious bug here is that if you rotate something like this, let's do it on the other side here. Given the right piece, yep, you can get outside the grid if you rotate it. So we're going to just check for that real quick to make sure we don't go past the edge of the array on the right-hand side. So we're going to say, in our rotating thing, say, if current piece x plus current piece length, because remember, as you rotate this, the dimensions of the array may change. So you have to check not just you have to check the size of it after you rotate it. Uh, current piece left is greater than or equal to grid width. Then you're past the edge, so we're just gonna go ahead and clamp that position. Current piece x equals grid width. minus the length. Okay, so theoretically, and let's do that on both of these. Theoretically, you should not be able to get past the edge of this thing now. Famous last words. Let's find out with this giant piece. Yep, it'll push you back over if you try to rotate. There you go. That's how you want it. Good. And as you can see, I just can't get past the edge there, so that's good. That's progress. Okay, now we have a Tetris game that controls a lot like Tetris actually should. Boop. Go. I guess just really quick we should add in controller keys for this too. So I don't know what the right controller key would be for this. So I'm just gonna say C key down A, I guess. I don't know. So this would be the on the diamond shape of a Xbox controller or a PlayStation controller. It, the letter A would be on the Xbox it would be letter it would be the letter A button. On a PlayStation controller, it would be the X, uh, because they're in the same physical position. So we'll call that rotate left, and we'll do uh, B on the controller for right, which would be the the far right part of the diamond on an Xbox controller. Uh, that would be the circle button on a PlayStation controller, which is what I'm about to use. So let's see if we can rotate. Oops, hang on a second. All right, there's left, there's right. All right, there you go. Looking like a game more and more all the time. Okay, cool, so that's hooked up. Take a sip of coffee here real quick. The choice of beverage at 1.30 in the morning. All right, cool, so we have input. It kind of works like that. What are we missing here? We're missing something important. Oh, we're, we're missing a couple of important things to the game itself, but since we can, we already have code here to select the next piece, we can keep track of what the next piece will be. We're going to do two select next pieces in a row, and we're going to change how this works. Instead of setting current piece to a random thing, we're going to set something called next piece. So we always have a next piece slotted in. Next piece, there we go. Um, wait, okay, so... Next piece, next piece equals that, okay. Okay, yes, that'll work. Okay, so we have current piece. We, we keep something called next piece, and that'll be the, the next piece that's meant to drop because most Tetris games show you over here, hey, just so you know, when you're done with this piece, this is the next one we're going to give you. So we keep that one slotted. The first time you call this, current piece will get set to nil because next piece isn't set. Set that to nil up here just so there's no question that's going to crash or anything. All right, so current piece gets set to next piece. We pick a random piece there and assign that so we know what our next one will be. And every time you call se select next piece, it'll slide the previously selected one onto the game board and pick another one for the next slot. Cool, and then we just need to render that. Render current piece, render, let's call that next piece.
And just to be pedantic about it, let's move that to a, a generic function called render piece. And so everywhere in here that we're calling current piece, we'll just make that called piece. So we don't have to write this thing out twice. Oh. I guess we'll have to write that too. Piece x. You ever write a word one too many times and it stops to look like it's spelled right? I'm having that moment with piece right now. Uh, okay, so. Okay, so now render piece is a nice generic function that will do that for us. So render current piece just becomes a very simple call to render piece. Current piece looking at our instance variable and then current piece x, current piece y. Okay, so that should continue to render correctly. Oh, nope, crash somewhere. Hang on. Uh, da, 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 da. Y. Look like render next piece. Oh, <laughs> I forgot to fill this in. Render next piece. And let's just have that do nothing because we're about to fill that in with something. Okay, so that's still doing the right thing. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so now we just need render next piece to show us the next piece we selected. And let's just draw it. So this, remember, uh, render piece is going to want to know where things are in terms of like positions in this grid, not in terms of pixels. So we're going to say that's 0, 0 right there in that corner. And that's 10 pieces across. And that'll be the 11th, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Let's call it 16. Let's call it 16. Why not? Let's see what it looks like for our x position. And our y position will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's call it 4. Let's call it 4 and see what happens. Let's see if it'll work. And there it is. So there's our next piece. Here's the one that's currently dropping. Let's we'll see if we get that as our next one. We do. Let's see if we get it again. We do. And then there's a yellow one coming next. There you go. And another yellow. And then there'll be a red one. A yellow. Okay. This seems to be working. I like that. Okay. Let's put a little border around that. Well, we already did code to do a border because it's this gray thing right here. So let's make this more generic. Now, this was the nice thing. I was trying to keep this simple by putting instance variable, uh, putting local variables here, just so I didn't have to hard code these numbers over and over again. But it's going to pay out here because instead of doing these as locals now, let's put them right up here as arguments to the function. And these can take a hike for now to wherever we did this, render grid border. We did that in render background, so now we can just move these here. Negative one. Could probably, you know, make this more clear than this, but it'll do for now. Alright, so now we just need to put a border around this next piece. Render grid border. I hear the fan of my laptop's going crazy. I wonder what that's about. Okay, so we know that this thing is here. So let's put the border at 3 over from, let's say 13. That might be too close. I don't know. Let's see. And 1. I don't know. We'll see. And then we'll make it 4 by 4. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, that wasn't close at all, but okay, this is good. Getting there, we're getting there. All right, so let's make that 14. That's probably closer. Let's make this more like 6 by 6. Okay, almost. Let's move this down one. Let's make that 8 by 8. Oh, not that many. Okay, there you go. Another common thread in game development is just tweaking numbers over and over again, forever and ever until you die. Okay, so one problem I'm seeing immediately is that this thing's not necessarily going to be centered, so we're going to try and, we're going to cheat because we've been using integers for this, but I bet it's going to work with floating point numbers, so we're going to just try and put one right in the middle. Okay, so if we have the grid border here, and we put the piece, let's do the grid border first, I don't think it actually matters for our purposes here, but just in case we overlap a little bit. Um, let me think here. If I were to do this, um, hmm. Let's 
just trying to think. I guess we'd want to do something like... Okay, let's do this. What would be the center on this? Center X. I guess if the size of this thing is 8, which might be excessive. I don't know. Let's see if 6 looks better on that. I feel like that's going to be too small if we get a... Let's do 8. That's fine. 8. Okay, so if we do that and we get this, we want to do 8 minus next piece length. Because remember, again, these are multi-dimensional arrays that might change from piece to piece. They're not all 2 by 2 or whatnot. So we do that, and then we divide it by 2. And then we're going to do this again, but we're going to do it with the first element of the array, which will tell you how long, how Make it as vertically. I'm not call it center x, we'll call it center y. So render piece. Okay. Let's try 16. Except it would be 13 would be the edge of this. We should probably put these in variables so we know what they are later on, but let's try 13 plus center x and 2 plus center y and see what happens. Okay, that looks pretty centered. Hey, I like it when things work on the first try. Yeah, look at that. Let's get science a different size, though. Oh, yeah, it's nice. Because you can see that one's still 3x3, three three, but it's 2x2 two two on the sides. Or right, three, 3 across, but 2 there. Let's get one that's a different size. Okay. Oh, and there we go. A nice vertical one that is still centered it really nicely. Okay, I like that. That's really super nice. They're all fitting, they're all in the right place. Oh, I love it when a plan comes together, okay. Which begs the question. Okay, let's not mess with success. We should probably do the grand old tradition of writing a fix me comment that we will never come back and fix, but don't hard code these numbers. Tradition, you're not a true game developer until you've done that many times with and had regrets and bugs attract you hours took you hours to track down that turned out to be a fix me that was never fixed. I'm not advocating this, I'm just saying this is how the world works sometimes. Um, okay. Cool. Alright, I can put a little text above that too. Let's see here. Uh, so in the same way, because we don't have any text on here yet, the same way that we have been doing arg outputs solids or borders, you can also do labels. And I'm probably going to get this wrong, we're going to try it. It's an array like all the others, so we do this little thing to smush another item into this. Let's do... Um, I have no idea what this number is going to be, so let's just throw some out here and see if it works. That's not going to work. Hang on. We need, like... So we're most of the way across the board here. This is 1280 over here, and that's 0 over here, so... Probably like 900 or something like that. Let's try that. So X, and then we're right near the top, because 0 is down here, so we'll call that... I don't know, 720 would be that, so let's call that, no, let's call it 600 and see what happens. I'm going to call it next piece, and then 10, and all white. Let's see what happens, I don't know. Alright, you can see it says it there, we just got to move it a little higher. Let's make that 675 and see what it looks like. That's a little too high, let's try 650. Yeah, that's good enough, I think. Let's try 640 and call it a day. Yeah, okay. Sure, why not? I mean, we could probably do some math to center that perfectly, but for our purposes, it's good. It's good. Okay. I love it. It's very nice. Okay. Um, what's next? Okay, so we can rotate. Oh, you can't actually win this game because... Completing a level, completing a row, will not actually clear it. So I guess we got to do that. It's probably kind of important to this whole thing. Yeah, okay, let's do that. Okay. That's where these things get messy. Um, right, let me think about that for a second here. Okay, so... The place to do that would be when we land the thing, when we specifically when we plan it. Where'd that function go? Plant current piece, okay. So in here, 
we make it a part of the landscape. We can get rid of this here because we already have a select next piece thing going there. Okay. Um, okay, so once it's planted, we can decide if any rows need to be cleaned out. So let's do that really quickly here. I guess what we would need to do for this, see if anything needs any rows need to be cleared out. Sometimes you just got to remind yourself, like, warning, this comment is here to let you know I'm about to do some math or mess with an array or something. So what we're going to do is we're going to look through every line. You could probably do this more efficiently. Wow, look what just happened there. That's crazy. Uh, that, whoa, what happened? Oh, uh -huh. I know what happened. Select next piece is not setting that back. Yeah, okay. Current piece X. I thought I'd fix this. I guess I didn't. Five. Current piece Y. So that's one of the nice things about hot loading, just having the game running all the time, is occasionally you look over after you made a change and go, whoa, why did it suddenly break? And then you know, I just made a change recently. I just saved this file a couple seconds ago, so it's got to be something I just did. And the goal is just to not absentmindedly make changes and be like, what did I change? Okay, so I saved that, and now this should go back to normal. Yeah, okay, we're back. Okay. Cool. Okay, so back to what we were doing. We're going to go through every row of this grid from top to bottom. And now, if CPU cycles were more in uh, a, a limited resource, but we're building Tetris on a modern computer, um, this is not a game, an original Game Boy. Um, you might want to just be like, this, we only want to look at the parts that where the thing planted instead of the whole board, but I think we can swallow the cost here. So we're going to look at each row of this, and if any row is completely full of squares, then nuke the row. So let's go ahead and start doing that. So let's look through this thing for y in 0 to grid height minus 1. That'll give you the whole grid vertically. We're just gonna have a local variable called full, which we'll set to true until proven otherwise. For x, we're gonna go across after, so now that we're iterating across each row, inside each row, we're gonna also iterate left to right instead of just going down. So to see if any of the things are an empty space. So for x in zero to grid with minus one. All right, so now that we're in here, we're gonna go if grid x, y does not equal zero. Now, I'm sorry, equal zero, saying that this space is not filled in with anything. Now, I know you're gonna, if you've done anything in C or PHP or JavaScript, you, you're gonna have this urge to just be like, well, if it's non-zero, I should just be able to go like that, if grid x, y, but z uh, numbers do not re uh, do not dither down to booleans like they do in C. So you have to actually say if it's equal to zero instead of just saying, you know, if not or whatnot. So, okay. So if it equals zero, we know this is definitely not full. Full is false. And then we're going to do break, and break works exactly like you think it would. Drops you out of this for loop. Okay. So... At the end of this for loop, let's see, at the end of this for loop right here, we've gone across the entire row. We can say, if full, let's say, no empty space in the row, you get, okay. And you want to do that inside of this first for, in, inside the outer for loop, because we're doing this for each row. Okay, so if it's full, yeah, that's right, okay. First off, remember this variable from the very, very beginning, score. We can keep track of your score now. We can check how many lines you've uh, removed, because now we're going to be actually looking at that. So if full score plus equals 1 adds 1 to your score. Uh, and now here comes the complicated part. We are going to have to actually get this line out of there. Now, you can't just delete a line because you have to 
make sure every line above it drops down by one when you do this. So you could, since uh, since multi-dimensional arrays are just arrays of arrays in Ruby, you could actually just delete the row and then pop another row in up at the top that's blank. But good game development tries to not create more memory than it needs to use, even if it's just cycling through it. So it, we already have an array. It's already set up. Let's just zero out the top row of it instead of theoretically putting something on the garbage collector and allocating a new object where you don't have to. Some people disagree on the system like this, I'm sure. I mean, this this Macintosh is like eight years old and has 16 gigabytes of RAM. I don't think it's going to be hurting playing Tetris, but, you know, good practices start at home, and, you know, code hygiene is your responsibility, so you don't have to get crazy about it, but you should try to think about things like that. All right, so let's, I say as we write in a high-level scripted language. Let's see. Okay, so let's go through this array. For i in, here comes a fun thing. Um, so y is our integer of the row we're looking at. We're going to say down to 1. That's always an interesting thing. So normally, when you if you were to do from i, from, for i in 0 to y, that would count up. But if y is the bigger number, then that would, or if y is the smaller number between that and 0, or 1 in this case, then this loop would do nothing. So uh, down 2 is a little bit of Ruby magic that basically gives you an iterator that counts down instead of going up, so that this loop will work. It'll step down instead of stepping up. So, ta-da. Okay. And then for j in 0 to grid width minus 1, and all we're going to do is go through there, and we're going to copy the line right above it. So this is the line that we're removing, we'll say, this one, this first uh, cyan line. We're going to say take the line right above it and copy all of those squares to this row. Um, and then by the time you get to the top, we're just going to zero out the top row, and everything will have slid down one row for our trouble, so, uh, let's see, so grid i, make sure I get this right, nope, I already got it wrong, hang on, because that comes first, so, okay, equals, same thing, j i minus 1, okay, and we did this down to 1, I forgot to mention that, the reason we didn't do down to 0 is because we want to not try to copy from the top row to the negative one index of the array, which would crash you. You don't want to do that. We're going to do something magic for the last row. All right, so that'll copy the row above it. Someone out there is probably like, oh my gosh, there's a much easier way to do that in Ruby, but we're just trying to keep this simple for now. All right, so that'll do that. And then, done. And then after we do that, we're going to do one last for loop for i in 0 to grid width minus 1. And we're just going to set this whole uh, grid, the top row of this thing, because we're do x, y, so that'll be iterating. Set that whole row to zero, like there are no squares in it. Cool. And that should theoretically do it. Let's find out. It didn't crash. That's a good start. All right, so let's try to get a Tetris going here. Let's see, bump. Okay, here's an easy one. See if the row blows up. Boom! Oh yeah! Look at this. In like a real game. I know you all tuned in to watch me play Tetris. I promise you, I'm not going to try and get a crazy thing here. But let's try to get a couple of these at a time and see if it works. Okay, yeah. Let's see if we can get three. Oh, it's the wrong L. Oh, I hate when that happens. Okay, hang on. Oh, maybe we'll get a real Tetris here. Let's see. Oh, you know what? We can. Let's see if one of those uh, long blocks will show up. Oh, the anticipation. Will he make it? I'm having nightmares about my childhood and the Game Boy right now. Okay, here we go. Boom! <laughs> Feels good, man. Okay. Okay, cool. So this is working. Love it. What's left to do at this point? I don't even know. I don't want to sit here and play this all night. Oh, I guess we should show the score. That's a good thing to do. So let's go set that up real quick. 
Um, okay, so we have the score just called score. We just need to draw that somewhere so we know what it is. Okay, let's do that. No, let's just do that in the render. Let's not even get fancy on this thing here. Let's see. Render. Where'd you go? I've lost it. Render. Def render. Ugh. Where are you? There you are. Okay, def render. Render score. See, I even I had clearly thought about this at some point because I wrote that down. Def render score. Okay. Now, we're not going to do anything fancy here. We're just going to use some text like we did for next piece over here. Args, output, plural, label, and then let's stick a thing in here for this. Let's try to stick it over here somewhere in this corner. So let's go like, I don't know, 75, 75. Score. Now here's the thing. You have string interpolation. I think that's what you would call it in Ruby. The same way as like in PHP, you might do score dollar sign variable name uh, instead of like some printf type thing. Like say you do hash uh, number sign whatever you want to call that thing, and then you wrap it in brackets. And in this case, we actually have a thing called score, and that'll these can be complex expressions in here. It doesn't have to be a simple variable name, but that's all we need for this. So uh, every time this runs, it'll figure out what that string should actually be with that variable set to the correct thing. So cool. We'll do that 10. And we'll just make that white for now. We can always mess with colors later. Let's see if we get a score here. There you go. Score zero. Let's see if we can get a score real quick to make sure that's actually incrementing. There you go, here's the fast one. Boom, okay, good. Nice, okay, so we have a score. What else do we need this thing to do? Oh, we need to fail when the game's over, so. Because um, right now, obviously that's not good. <laughs> so we're gonna have to do something with that. Um, let's figure that out real quick here. Okay, do we have a game over state? I think I wrote that. Yes, I did. Okay, so we have a flag called game over that we're going to set when the game is over. So we need to figure that out real quick. And we can do that, I think. I think the game over state in Tetris is when a new piece comes in and has nowhere to move, it's game over. So what I think we'll do is playing current pieces when a new, we, we drop a new one in. We see if any rows need to be cleared out, so that'll fix that. Oh, let's do this then, actually. Hang on. We'll select a piece here after the rows have been cleared out. And we'll say, what was the name of the function for collision? Current piece colliding. OK, so when we call select next piece, the current piece gets set to a new one at the top of the board. And we say, if current piece colliding. We don't let it move again. We just check it right at the top. If it's already colliding when it comes in, that's game over. And we'll just say at game over equals true. Does that sound right? Yeah, okay. And then we're going to save this, but this won't do anything because we don't have anything in here yet to do anything with game over. So it's still in the same place, but we know at this point the game is over. So all we really need to do, I think, is in the iterate function. Before we check any input, we don't let them move or anything. If the game's over, don't do anything. If at game over, yeah, OK. I'm just going to say return, which say all this logic to move the pieces, update the game board, or you know check if the user's touching any of the controls, just don't do it. Just return from this function immediately and don't do not do anything in there. So it'll just go on and render what's there without letting any of the game state change. So let's try that real quick. So if nothing else, we shouldn't get this big uh, backup of pieces at the top. You should just stop at this point. And there it is. You don't get a new piece. Nothing's moving. OK. So. Now we just need to do something fancy with this. Let's see, render. Where are you at? I can never find this function. That's why we have a list. OK. Render background, render score. Just stick this in render score. Why not? If at game over, we 
see here. Yeah, okay, let's do this. So let's do. Here, we'll do uh, okay, args, outputs, labels. And then let's, um, let's get a giant thing on the screen here. So there, there. Okay, call it 200, 450. Game over. Make this gigantic and white, just like me. Okay. Um, okay, I don't know. Let's see if it works. Let's see if it works. Let's crash the thing real quick. Or just fail. It's not going to crash, hopefully. But, and boom, game over. Well, that, that seems to seems like a very serious way to say game over, so that's pretty good. Um, now, of course, the problem is now the game is locked up. It won't do anything else, so let's... Um, Let's let them get back to this real quick. Now, I'm going to advocate for a very simple way to do this. Now, in a more complex game, you would never, ever want to do this, but this is a good way to do it just for a simple game like Tetris for the time being. Uh, we're going to check in here. So if, if, if we're in the game over state and we're iterating through here, instead of checking any of your left and down to move pieces, we will let you at this point hit the space bar or the start button on a controller to reset the whole thing. We're going to use the same magic thing we used at the top, GTK reset. Where'd you go? If K, key down, space, or controller, key down, start, then reset the whole thing. All the variables go back to zero they get unset and you build a new game state on the next one, which is fine for our purposes. Normally you might want to do things like go to a high scoreboard or something like that, and all that state would also be wiped out, so you wouldn't want to use GTK reset. You'd want to go in here and manually reset the grid to zero and stuff like that, but we're going to be lazy for now and call it GTK reset. So let's see if it works. i grab my controller so I can be all fancy about this. Dun, 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 dun. There we go. Okay. Being cool. Dun dun. Oh, I've lost control of my game. Here we go. Game over. I can't move it, but I'm gonna hit start. There we go. Running again. Here, let me get a score to make sure everything is resetting here. My score is one, and then we'll just let this go to hell. Game over. Hit start. Score goes back to zero. Okay. Good. All right, I'm running out of things to do on this. This is really looking very Tetris-like at this point. Um, what else can we do? What else? Um, got the next piece thing. There you go. We can put a cute little thing on here. So we haven't done any sprites because it's just not that kind of game. Sprites are like JPEGs or PNGs and stuff like that. You know, just a thing. Pixel data. Uh, if you were a 3D programmer, you would call it a texture. But since we're mostly thinking about 2D games, we call it a sprite. And I'm going to call this, I'm going to draw one of these right here. So when you make a game with Dragon Ruby, there's a handful of graphics that are built in, just some very basic stuff. Like you can see, we have a little Dragon Ruby thing up there because we need it. But, um, but let's do sprites. Oh, where my thing go? Sprites. Um, one of the ones that is in there by default is called console logo. It's literally this thing I just showed you here. It ships there so that we can show it in the... It ships so you can see the console. And I'm going to use this because if you're playing along on the Fiddle website, you can't upload your own graphics to it, but this one is definitely guaranteed to be there. So I'm going to go ahead and stick this on here. Uh, the arguments for this are X and Y. Punch in some numbers here. And then width and height, because it'll scale the image if you want it to. And then the name of the file console logo.png, which just happens to be the name of the file that we ship with the thing. Um, the first time, the first frame that this uses, that the renderer sees this uh, file name, it will load it from disk, get it into a texture so I can draw it with OpenGL or Metal or Direct3D, whatever. Um, and then the next time it sees this, it'll already have cached that in a texture, so it doesn't load it from disk every frame. Um, and it keeps a little little map of those inside the engine for you. So you don't have to worry about loading these from disk, you just have to give us the file name at the right point, and we take care of getting that 
onto the screen and doing it fast in future iterations. So makes your life easier. Let's see if this pops up. Yes, there you go. Nice and fancy. Okay, I'm, I don't know. I don't know what else to do at this point. Let me think. I think we've run out of cool things to do. Yeah, maybe, I guess. All right, so where do we end up here? There's only a few comments in this. But we're just under 250 lines of code to do the whole game of Tetris. That's not too bad. I love it. Okay, so I'm going to post this thing as a gist, so if you want to just pull this down and play with it, either on your own copy of Dragon Ruby or on the Fiddle website, you can do this. Um, there are obviously still bugs in this. As you can see, you can slide these through other pieces. Obviously, you don't want to be allowed to do that. Um, and I'm sure we can find some other things to improve in here. You can certainly make this flashier. Um, but that's it. That's, that's how to write Tetris in 250 lines of Ruby code in the Dragon Ruby game toolkit. Um, so that's kind of fun. Oh, let's do one more thing while we're here. I don't know how long we've been doing this for, but get one more thing. Let me pull my terminal up here real quick here. Uh, no, let's see, library, where does itch hide this thing? Locations, port, itch, apps, dragon ruby. Okay, so let me go ahead and do one more thing here. While I'm thinking about it. let's go ahead and close this up. Boop, okay. Um, inside of my game, which is in the standard place we put this by default, there is a thing called metadata, and in the game metadata, there's all this gobbledygook right here. I'm just going to do this real quick. Take the hashes out in front of it, because you need that for just, you know, whatever. I'm going to call this Dragon Triss. Why not? Dragon Triss. No copyright infringement at all. No trademarks violated. I think is what my login is. I'll oh, call it Piculus. I don't know. Whatever. Dev title Ryan C. Gordon. Now we keep this metadata for a couple of reasons, not the least of it being when I launch this game again, it'll read that metadata file. And look, it's got a title bar. It doesn't say hello SDL anymore. So we can still play it. Looks good when it's not scaled. Okay, cool. Um, more importantly than that, I'm not going to do this now because I don't have it set up on itch.io, but from here, you could run Dragon Ruby Publish, a little program that comes with Dragon Ruby. I'm going to type only package as a command line for this. I don't know if this is going to work. We're going to try it. Sometimes I get this wrong on the first try. I'm going to type my game. And this should spit out a whole bunch of gobbledygook. And when it's done, all platform builds are complete. Hooray. Let's open the builds directory. As you can see, it spit out a whole bunch of different things here. Um, Dragon Triss is what I called it. So I pulled all that from the metadata file. There's your HTML version of it if you want to upload it to a website so people can play it on in their web browser, or you want the 64-bit Linux version, or the Raspberry Pi version, or the Windows version, or the Mac version, which, as you can see, uh, this is just the default icon. You could change that if you wanted to. When you double-click this, hopefully this will work. Yes, there you go. Now you have a native Mac application, no longer running in the build environment, and you're playing Tetris that you made yourself, and you can give this out to your friends, and they can just play it on their own machines. Um, now, when I ran that, I, I ran that with uh, the only package command line, so it just makes a bunch of packages for different platforms, but uh, if you don't have that option set up in there and you've set up the correct things on itch.io, you can have this automatically upload new versions of the game to itch.io for people to pay for if you want them to buy it from you, but and be auto-updated, and I think that's pretty neat. Um, uh, it makes it very easy not just to make a game, but also to publish it. And that's as far as my sales pitch for Dragon Ruby goes, but I'm very proud of how that turned out, and I think it's been pretty neat. And I think you might like it too, so I thought you might like to see it. Um, so that's it. That's our game. Full screen with this. Oh, yeah. 
Um, um, thank you for watching this. I've had a lot of fun doing this. I hope you've learned something. Uh, you know, if you want to take the source code and do something cool with it, I'll leave you know leave a comment in the YouTube things and you know a link to your own version of it. Add some sound to it. Add uh, some sparkly graphics instead of just simple rectangles like we did here. Um, but that's it. It's a, it's a, that's an entire game built very quickly, relatively speaking, in Ruby in this uh, game engine. And all right, I guess that's it. Thank you for watching. Uh, maybe we'll do another of these later if people liked it. All right, take care. Bye.